Thank you so much for joining us. I hope everybody is well in these times of uncertainty and difficulty and for some folks, um, incredible pain. That said, the work must continue. We must continue to build our communities and our resistance and the world that we wanna live in. So this, my name is Kat, uh, Kat Brooks. I am the co-founder of the Anti-Police Terror Project. I am also the executive director of the uh, Justice Teams Network. Uh, Justice Teams Network is a statewide network with anchor organizations in 11 cities um, that work with impacted families and communities to resist state violence. And all of the data shows, and we believe very deeply, that the only way that we are going to decrease and ultimately eradicate um, state-sponsored violence against our people is by diminishing and decreasing the ways, times, reasons why our folks have to engage with law enforcement. And that's gonna be true until we completely transform the way this country thinks about public safety, um, accountability, crime, et cetera. So this is part of a six, maybe seven week series. We're still working on a couple of other people that we're gonna do. I'm very excited to introduce my comrade, my sister, another co-founder of the Anti-Police Terror Project, Asanta Boykin, who has pioneered, we talked about this for so many years, um, and she just went and did it, um, pioneered an alternative response to mental health crisis that does not lead with law enforcement. Asantawa is not only the co-founder of the Anti-Police Terror Project, she's also a registered nurse, has spent many, many, many years working in mental health facilities and as a mental health crisis response nurse. Um, so she doesn't only have the political education, she has the scientific education and the medical education and has put all of that together to create this amazing model. So I'm gonna turn it over to Asantua. I'm gonna let her talk about the model. Um, and then I may ask her some probing questions and then we'll get some Q&A from you all. And that'll be our first webinar. Thank you everybody for joining us. Please welcome Asantua Boykin. Peace, thank you for that um, humbling introduction. <laughs> um, as to said, my name is Asantua. I'm one of the co-founders of the Anti-Police Terror Project and the Anti-Police Terror Project um, created Mental Health First or MH First. Um, I think what we found is that we were providing the type of care that we wanted to see. Um, to our folks, right, our, um, our immediate and then also distant circles of folks that we were in space with. And the way that we did that was brilliant and also organic, right? Um, there were times where we created safety plans, right, and schedules and how to bring meals to folks who were in crisis. And we um, did that just because we love them, right? And we also understood that um, calling the police or a 5150 or forced medication um, wasn't what they needed in that moment, right? Um, so the question that we began to ask ourselves is how do we create this um, in a way where it is accessible to our larger community members? Because we know that um, being in the midst of a mental health crisis increases your chances of being brutalized, assaulted, or even murdered by police, right? Um, we hear so many of these stories where we see these egregious videos of folks being murdered or harmed. And like, for instance, the recent case that happened in San Leandro with the young man who was clearly in the midst of a mental health crisis and um, he was subsequently murdered by police. Uh, watching that video, I was like, there's like 500 things that me and two other people could have done without weapons to, de to de-escalate. Um, that situation, but unfortunately we have a system that has uh, relied on police and policing in order to fix our public health crisis, right? Our mental health public health crisis, our homelessness public health crisis. Um, and I anticipate that as we kind of continue this journey with um, COVID, the police will again, right, be put in a place to be dealing with yet another public health crisis that we cannot incarcerate and or um, arrest our way out of. Huh. All right, I, I, I prefer conversation <laughs> when we do these things and I understand that just the format, it's maybe kind of hard to do that. Are we frozen? 
you're fine. Oh wait, did she just freeze? She just froze. All right, y'all, give us a second. There you are. There you are. Okay. All, right. All right. All right. Can folks hear me? Did you hear me for the past yes. two, two seconds? Awesome. So um, again, we begin to ask ourselves, how can we create this thing to where it would be available to to the larger community, right? Because we de the best way to decrease chances of being um, murdered or harmed by police is to decrease um, interactions. Right, so if the police don't have an opportunity to interact with our folks and they also do not have the opportunity to harm or murder our folks, right? Um, so then MH First was born and really it was just a few folks who, um, who had the same idea, right? Um, and we were like, okay, how do we do this? So uh, we created a training, which we call um, the Mental Health First Aid Handbook, right? And it was loosely based off another training um, that was out of Australia called of Mental Health First Aid. But that training also um, heavily leaned on the clinical process of like um, being held against your will, using the police as backup. So we really wanted to create, um, we took the key parts of the training that worked and then kind of, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, workshop them to kind of fit our goals and our mission, which is to more assist someone in solving their own crisis, right? Like not to intervene and then create a codependent relationship where then that, that they need MH first, right? The next time they're in crisis. Our goal is to really help them create a safety plan that is self-affirming, that is centered around their actions um, and not necessarily ours. So um, big up to Chayo who did a lot of work. Um, Chayo, I don't know if you're on here, who, who did a lot of work creating that, that, um, that training and that language. And also within that, there is a basic uh, first day training uh, a lot of the times, just because folks don't, we just don't know, right? Like our healthcare system has created a dependent relationship where like they don't teach us how to take care of ourselves. They teach us how to need them in order to be healthy. So um, there's a lot of like medical conditions that sometimes will mask as um, mental health crisis, right? Or, or um psychiatric symptoms. For instance, if someone's blood sugar is low, they may be confused or they may kind of, they may black out or lose time. So our basic first aid training is really centered around um, how to differentiate between when someone may possibly be having a medical crisis or if someone is possibly um, having uh, psychiatric symptoms. So in order to, to um, one thing we have to accept is someone usually calls the police, right? So how do we um, mitigate or provide space for someone to liaison with police if they are on scene, right? So this is why we have a three person team. One person would be designated as um, the contact person. And that really is whoever has had the opportunity to build rapport, or has the most shared identities with the person that we are interacting with. And we've chosen to use the word participant and not patient and not client, right? Um, because we are all participating in mitigating the crisis that um, that our participant is currently in. So we have um, our contact person, and then we also have um, someone who is hopefully, right, because we do work on a volunteer basis, someone who is either hopefully medically trained, an EMT, a nurse, whatever, if someone happens to be on shift. If not, then everyone has received that basic first aid training, but that will be their their role. Um, and then we also have um, a third person, and that person is our safety liaison. And it is that person's job to interact with police. And um, if, if anyone who takes that role, there's some like real checking in, right? I'm real clear that I should never probably be that person <laughs> because please trigger me in a way, right? So um, there's some real checking in about who takes that role, their capacity, like, what identities do they have that would offer them an advantage um, in dealing with police? And then also not just, that person doesn't just interact with police if they're on scene, but they also interact with community members because sometimes there's people, especially if it's like a scene scene, right? Like folks are on looking, folks have questions, folks are making comments, and it would be that person's job to kind of interact with folks and take a second to maybe offer, offer education, um, not really giving details of the situation, but um, just kind of providing care for community members who may be looking on and perhaps be traumatized or even triggered. 
Um, so that's our, our three person team. They are, what's really important is for us, there are just a few reasons why we always, always dispatch, right? Um, and a few of those reasons are if police have been called, right? Another reason is if police are already uh, on scene. And then we ask the question, are you safe, right? Because when we think about the mental health system as it currently stands, the primary question that you get asked is, do you want to kill yourself? Do you want to hurt other people? So, um, and so, you know, folks answer yes, some folks are sincere, sometimes it's conditional. So what we really want to do is ask that person, are they in a safe space, right? And if that answer is no, then we always dispatch. Um, then our next question is, can you get to a safe place, right? Or can you agree to be safe until we're able to make, um, can, in, until we're able to make contact with you? And technically speaking, that term is called contracting for safety. Do you agree not to harm yourself until we make contact? Do you agree um, that you can stay on the phone? Do you agree not to harm anyone until we make contact with you? And that's basically the person promising that they will do that. Um, another key, uh, just a couple key things in case folks were thinking about um, replicating, duplicating, doing something similar. Um, my inbox is an open door. So if you have questions, you're like, hey, we want to throw down, you know, I'd be happy to talk to anyone, do anyone. There's no, uh, not do anyone, Jesus Christ. Um, have conversations with anyone who's like looking to do, yeah, you can share my email, Annie, um, who's looking to kind of do similar work. Uh, so yeah, email me or shoot me a DM on Facebook and I'll gladly, you know, we can have a conversation. But one thing to be um, aware of are no one that works for MH First is employed. Everyone's volunteered, uh, volunteers. And there's a really good reason for that and it's a legal one, right? So anytime someone is providing care to another person within the scope of their knowledge, they technically are operating under Good Samaritan laws, right? Um, and Good Samaritan laws protect you in a way where if something happens to said person, then you are not um, legally uh, responsible for that. As long as you are unpaid and you are working on your own accord um, and you don't do anything um, above your knowledge base, right? So for instance, um, if, you, um, if you provide CPR to someone because they were unresponsive and you're doing chest compressions, right? And let's say they accidentally pop a lung, if you know um, CPR and that actually have, you're still not, you're not legally liable, right? For um, their lung popping because you were within your scope of practice. Now, if someone uh, stopped breathing and you decided to do a tracheostomy and you're not a doctor, right? Uh, then you're, you're operating outside of your scope of knowledge and you are then liable. Um, so that is something to consider. And then also if you are being paid for your work, then there has to be like liability insurance and all this like really high-minded stuff that I asked someone else to read up for me because uh, <laughs> it's, it's quite, quite, um, quite in depth. But we've had some real successes, I think. And there's, there's also a thing called HIPAA, right? So you cannot um, share anyone's health information if you are not directly involved in providing care for that person, right? So even as I like, I want to tell y'all we did this and it was great, right? But um, you know, there is a real risk that even telling minimal details, right? Uh, one might be able to be like, oh, that was Shirley, right? Because I have a friend who did that and she lived, right? So um, we have had some like real successes as far as like reaching certain um, certain demographics of folks. Um, our calls come in consistently, I would say. Um, and a lot of it so far has been safety planning. Um, and when I say safety planning, it's, you know, someone is feeling overwhelmed. Um, they don't know what they're going to do next. So just sitting down um, and talking to someone and saying, okay, yeah, great job. So tomorrow morning, how are we going to, how, how are you going to take care of yourself? And um, just kind of helping and walking um, through the process. What we found is people really, and maybe it's just a generational thing or because we have the technology available, um, we've done a lot of texting, right? A lot of um, Facebook and IG 
DMs versus like actually picking up the phone and um, and having a vocal vocal conversation. So we've had some really awesome community partners who have offered us space and resources. We are currently housed at uh, Transitions Buprenorphine Clinic, which is a well-established uh, buprenorphine clinic here in um, Oak Park in Sacramento. Um, and if anyone has questions about what buprenorphine is, feel free to email me. We can talk about it. It's a super dope drug that helps folks um, get off of uh, opiates. Um, and then also another harm reduction services. They bought a new car or a new RV and they gave us their old one, which is like awesome. It's a well-known a vehicle in the community. So I know when people see it, they know that there's help inside. And I'm really glad that we've been able to um, kind of maintain that, uh, the reputation of that RV. It's actually, I think someone just took it to go do jail support um, a few minutes ago. So yeah, that's, that's MH First. I feel like some of our next steps is uh, figuring out how to get our name out there, right? Because we are, um, working on volunteer basis only any funds that we've raised um, previously were just like straight up crowdsourcing, right? Just other folks in, um, in the community who wanted to see this happen as well. Um, so yeah, we're working on advertising, getting our, um, getting the name and the number um, out there so folks can utilize it, utilize it when they need it. Yeah, there goes the Facebook dope. Um, and we have a little ambulance with the, cross on it right and um our tagline is mental health first community first safety first wellness first and we really use a um a self-determined safety kind of framework uh one of the things that i find especially as a nurse that um there is this unilateral sense of normalcy and it, like unilateral sense of what is safe and like what is not safe right and we understand that 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 um, that exists on a spectrum, right? Um, what is safe for someone here may not be safe, right? Like it's perfectly safe for me to scramble eggs. It may not be safe for my three-year-old to be at the stove he can't reach. So we really try to just meet folks where they're at in a way that um, provides the space for people to be self-determined because it isn't our goal to um, to make people be different, right? Um, our goal is to help people make themselves safe. Yeah. So if there's any questions, I don't know if I should open up the inbox or cat. I think my spiel. I got it. Okay. Is that, is that, is that the spiel? You done? That's the spiel. That's the spiel. <laughs> <laughs> That's the spiel. Okay. So I'm, I've got some questions and I'm going to intersperse them with some of the questions we're getting from folks that are um, tuned in. So the first question we have is, do you find that contracting for safety is effective or do people harm themselves frequently after having promised not to do so? Have there been surveys of that type of information? Um, I know that contracting for safety is a practice that I've used um, inside of um, our current healthcare system. And I have found it to be effective when you and the participant mean it right because it's a little different when you say i care about your safety can you agree to be safe until a next very tangible time point and i think that that's the difference um asking someone to contract for safety for 365 days is one thing asking someone to contract for safety for the next 15 minutes is different so when it's used in a sense where yes i care and the time frame is tangible then yes i have seen it be extremely successful i have also seen it not be successful when the time frame is too long or when it's just one of those um assessment questions that we have to check a checkbox right right so the person and you are not um invested in them in their safety right so it i, I to answer the question, it depends on the participant, it depends on the practitioner, um, but I, I have seen it be successful, yes. So Asandoa, pre-COVID, when we could be in communication with people, mm -hmm. let's say a call came into the MH first line mm -hmm. and that needed dispatch, walk us through what would happen. Um, 
so what would happen we have a bunch of forms that i i would love to get rid of <laughs> because i think it kind of encourages uh people to kind of do the checkbox thing and we really just want like fluid conversation so what would happen is we would take take the person's information that we've compiled in our forms we usually the things that we are dispatching with which is like a medic bag um, survival resources. Sometimes we have blankets, uh, sleeping bags, because reality is we just have a large unhoused population and we want to be able to meet those folks' needs the best that we can since we are up driving around at 2 a.m. Um, so it would look like us getting in the car. Um, it looks like us going to the scene. And part of our training is um, like spatial awareness, like being aware of what's around you, thinking about exit plans. And we actually use a acronym called BAPE, which is breathe, um, assess, plan, and then engage, right? So that just reminds our folks that even before we jump out of the car with our capes on and all of our adrenaline pumping, that we just take, um, we take a moment to take a deep breath, um, assess our surroundings, decide who's talking when, what are the roles, and, and before we engage anyone, right? Whether that be the participant, their family, or um, onlookers, and especially, especially police. Post-COVID, what has the work looked like and where do you see it going? Uh, Post-COVID, we have decided to do phone support only, meaning that we are not dispatching. And our volunteers mostly are like folks that have similar um, political ideologies, right? So we don't tell folks what to do in a, <laughs> to, in a, to a certain degree, but we do agree that, that we are not dispatching. Now, I can't, I also can't say that if, if I particularly got a call and was like, you know, my family member friend is in crisis and the police are on scene, I could not contract for safety to say that I wouldn't dispatch because I would be thinking about like, well, if the police are there, this person could be harmed. But fortunately, we haven't had that happen since the lockdown. So we've been providing a lot of uh, phone support. We've answered texts, DMs, um, talked to folks. I'm really anxious to get our volunteers back in the clinic, um, back in the RV, back in the cars, back on the street, because um, it's needed. Yeah. Question from Leroy Moore. Do you all, um, have an analysis around disability justice? Is the line hooked into the police? Do you deal with people with mental health and other disabilities like autism? Um, we, when, when we do get calls from folks, we very rarely get into their like medical history. We're really dealing with the crisis that is at hand. Um, I cannot, I'm, I'm thinking about the different cases that we've dispatched and we haven't bumped up against it yet. Right, we haven't um, bumped up against folks that are differently, differently able to in a way that's apparent. Right, um, so yeah, no, we haven't bumped up against it yet. So we haven't had the opportunity to use an example to create framework. Um, what I can say is that we treat everyone the same. Right, we treat everyone with with the um, with the assumption that they are capable of taking care of themselves, um, and that we are simply there to assist them in um, in doing so. Question, um, a bunch of questions, okay. Uh, John asks, can you describe interaction with the police when responding to a participant um, and officers show up? So um, our ideal framework um, looks like, hello officer, we are MH first and explaining what MH First is. And then also explaining that our goal is to help this person through this crisis. And that right now we don't believe that police assistance um, is needed. We have not had the opportunity to, and we kind of kick this like back and forth, like how do we introduce ourselves to PD, right? Like, do we say, hey, hey PD, we're MH First, we're in operation on your streets, uh, <laughs> uh, watch out, right? Or do we wait for the opportunity to, to, to start? To, because we're going to have to have a relationship. And, and when I say relationship, I don't mean like we're going to have to be friends, right? But we do have to have a relationship with PD. And uh, what we've decided is to wait for the opportunity for them to address us while we're on scene. 
that way they have an acute understanding and awareness of who we are, why we're there, and it isn't our goal, um, and we have to kind of hammer this part into the training, where it is not our goal to be contentious with PD while on scene, um, but it is our job to kind of keep them busy in a way from our participant, especially um, if their assistance isn't needed. Sandra, can you talk about the ways in which Sacramento uh, has responded? And I'm not talking about the people, I'm talking about the, the system. Um, yo, know, it's, it's been, um, it's been mad crazy. I think that um, we did not anticipate that, I mean, I don't know, it's just that we've been just welcomed so warmly, we've been given um, like the resources that we needed to kind of operate. And I don't think that we anticipated that the community would be so ready for something like this, right? I think we anticipated um, uh, bumping up a lot of naysayers and this is ridiculous. What, you know, what are y'all doing, you know? But um, the Sacramento community has been very welcoming. Um, they've been all on board with MH First and the work that we plan on doing. And um, it's been really, really encouraging right to see and in particular you've had some state officials reach out correct um yes <laughs> i mean i think this is important to talk about because <laughs> there's so much resi i mean as people you know think about this and either engage with aptp in other cities to build this um it's important to recognize that like the state will see something that is working or that the people are responding to mm -hmm. and try to engage. And I think um, talking to people about what that has looked like and what mm -hmm. boundaries you have put in place, I think could be helpful. Right. So I know for instance, for, for one, like my job had, had, had got wind that we were like building this thing and they approached me and were like, Hey, we would like to feature like your program on this, whatever it was, right? And I was just like, but the only way they can do that is they had to, um, they had to uh, say that they somehow helped me build it. So, right. So they said, you know, did we provide you any resources? And I was like, no. Um, well, did we give you any days off um, to work on it? I was like, no. Um, they said, well, did we give you any uh, pay time off? And I was like, no, <laughs> any unpaid time off. And I'm like, no, right? So we, we have had to be guarded, right? Um, guarded in a sense where we rely on each other for, um, for, you know, kind of like sounding boards in a sense, because I did go to some of my colleagues, like this sounds shady, right? I just saw someone say shady, like, yeah, like it did, it, um, it felt like mad shady. Um, so there are instances where like, um, we've had, I think one of the BOS, someone was just like, hey, let, let, us, let us take care of your, your RV like registration. And we're like, mm, I don't know, right? But then um, they also had um, a very personal relationship with um, the things that we're working on. So it was kind of like understood. So being, being discerning about um, who we've accepted resources from, who we've um, decided to be in collaboration with has definitely been, been a learning process. Jade Lynn asks, um, what does your aftercare look like for folks post the immediate crisis? So there is no official framework for it. What we do have is a booklet that um, kind of travels with the phone, right, and with um, and with our files, um, and it's it's a follow up book. So if it, like if I take a call from someone and I've done this, um, I've been like, hey, could you call X person back at X um, phone number and ask them A, B, and C, right? Um, how did it go? Like for instance, one one person's safety plan was they were going to get up in the morning and write down how they were feeling and take a long bath. So I would. I wrote a note, will you check in with X person and ask them how did their bath and what did they write, right? So then the person who's next on shift would pick up that phone and call that person and check in with them. And we actually had, 
had a similar situation happen and that person was super appreciative that it wasn't just that one phone call that they got another one, right? And that they felt they were being held accountable for what they said they were going to do for themselves. Nice. Um, Guadalupe would like you to reiterate Asantua, uh, who is on your team and what roles do they play? Yes, we have a, um, the name of this person like goes back and forth. Um, it's the crisis interventionalist and that is really the person who is um, inter engaging with the participant. Then we have a, um, a first aid person, right? We hope that um we hope that that person is medically trained if not then we offer basic first aid training and then we also um have the safety liaison and it is that person's job to interact with community members more specifically to interact with police um and hopefully give them some information on what the escalation really looks like and so are, do people sign up for shifts meaning like you know from nine to twelve you know you can call cat uh, to go out or from 12 to 3 you can call Annie to go out like are people on call um, based on the rest of the way their lives are structured particularly since this isn't a paid gig <clears throat> so um, so there's our pre-COVID and our post-COVID right so pre-COVID literally folks were in a clinic from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. and they signed up for those shifts um, we were in conversation about what does it look like to split shifts because sometimes folks have um, have a really hard time staying up all night, right? But we also don't require folks to stay up all night. Like we do sleeping shifts. So even if you're on shift, you do get the opportunity to like take like a three or four hour nap. And it really is an agreement about those folks that are on shift. Like for me, I don't need to sleep. I already work night shift, I'm used to it, right? So largely I, I, I will let the folks that I'm on shift with, right? Take as much time as they need to rest because most folks don't aren't used to being up um, all night. So post COVID though, literally there's been like some core like um folks who um who are at the table and some of our um, most consistent volunteers who are literally taking the cell phone to their home and answering the phone there and we have a singular phone and the reason why we don't allow um like folks to get calls to their personal phones is because there's the hipaa thing right there's we're humans, sometimes humans have poor boundaries, and it's just a safeguard that our participants' names, phone numbers, stay in a location that is not being passed around, right? Because other words, if we forwarded, then um, so-and-so's number would forever be in my call log, right? Um, and we don't want to create that situation. So the phone will get passed around post-COVID. Pre-COVID, we were all in clinic together. We have a question from Shirley. How much training and requirements is needed to volunteer and what are the expectations for volunteers? So we do have, um, so our training is a day long training um, and that really depends on um, who's in the room, right? Um, as like how long it's gonna be and that's a variation of like six to 10 hours, right? It just depends um, on, on who's in the room. Um, forgetting part of the question. So that's the requirement, right? Is that you're just trained. Um, yeah, that's it. Um, and that you're trained by us, right? And that, and that you're also in alignment with the, with, with the political values of wanting to de-escalate, right? And um, understanding that it is not our goal to call the police on someone. Um, I'm losing my thoughts. Okay, so requirements, did that. What was the second part of that question? Oh, I dismissed it. Uh, what are the requirements to volunteer? And I believe can, I, I, I mean, I think that was the gist of it. Uh, okay. If not, uh, if not, Shirley, uh, hit us up and we will get to the second part of your question if you don't feel like it was answered. Um, oh, expectations. One of, oh, 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 expectations. Okay. So e expectations is we do have um, our, our volunteers sign a confidentiality agreement. Um, because a lot of the times like we're in close community with folks like period um like even without like being in the same community we are all typically just like an arm's distance from each other socially so um you have to agree to not share any information from your calls with anyone period point blank um not only because it's, it's like the right thing to do but also we don't want to violate um anyone's um health information and I, I left out an um, important part of our team. I'm sorry, Kat. We do have two wonderful medical directors um, 
both, one is a family practice physician, the other is a psychiatrist and um, family practice physician. Um, and they are on call for us anytime we have folks on shift. There are some things that they can do. Um, our doctors go out and dispatch when they need to. They will get up out of bed, get in a car and go to, uh, uh, go to a participant that's on scene. Um, so as we kind of explore more into this and just get more practice, we're in conversation about like broadening their scope so that they can do more with and for us. So just shout, shout them out. We do have on-call docs. I'm going to merge two questions. So Trudy from one of JTN's anchor orgs and Powerhouse all on their own, Dignity and Power Now, um, they were scheduled for a training pre-COVID, so like this pre-pandemic, post-pandemic, mm -hmm. BC, AC. Um, anyway, uh, is there another training scheduled soon? Um, and how can folks link, link it, link into it? So we are getting ready to schedule. Um, we just had a meeting like last week and decided that we're going to be offering, um, we're just going to start offering trainings quarterly because the question keeps coming up and we failed to just like be like, we're training on the third Thursday of every, right? So we're just going to start offering trainings uh, quarterly. So keep an eye on our Facebook page, keep an eye on APTP's Facebook page or IGs, um, and we'll announce that. So while we have done a couple trainings via Jitsi, which is a different app, I believe Jitsi is actually encrypted, which is why we chose to use it over like Zoom or like live. Um, so we have done a couple trainings via Jitsi and they worked out great. So um, while we're under COVID, our trainings will be Jitsi or like Zoom. Um, and then after that, we'll begin to offer um, quarterly in-person trainings once we're able to be in space with each other. I'm going to answer on my own a couple of questions that have come in in terms of where people can connect or if there's connections in their city. So right now, Image First is, is active in Sacramento. The next rollout uh, city will be Oakland, California, and we're in process of making that happen now. Um, with the Zoom trainings, yeah, they can be <laughs> they can be done all over the place. So um, those are those questions. But yeah, the next actual city that we're focusing on uh, will be Oakland, and then we'll go from there. Um, let's see. I saw that oh. question. We have not run into ICE yet. Okay. How do you know that's where I was going to go? Because it, yeah. What would you do if you I, did run into ICE? Like uh, that part. You know, I'm I'm really transparent in the sense where, like, we are legit making this up as we go along, because there isn't a program that is um, community-centered, participant-centered, based on self-determination um, without police. So I don't know. I don't know. Um, I think I, I think my brain tells me we would deal with them in the same way that we that we deal with police and um, demand space in order to, um, to assist our participant. Um, but yeah, we don't know, we don't know. If anyone has any advice or has done it, or again, my, um, my email is the open door, so. Uh, an anonymous attendee says, thank you so much for speaking. Can you talk about de-escalation tips if you are witnessing someone having a mental health crisis in the moment? So one of the things we, we workshop some scenarios, right? Like what if, and, and a lot of the scenarios that we work through and also using our trainings are like super extreme, right? So for instance, um, what if someone is like running in and out of traffic, right? Um, I think what our current framework, not our current framework, but like the mental health establishment, right? Framework would um, put us in a position to control the person. Whereas our framework would put us in a place to control traffic until that person gets themselves to safety, right? Mm -hmm. Because um, putting hands on someone, dragging them out of the street, maybe using a taser or, you know, and then also the understanding that that person is obviously not in our shared reality and does not feel that they are in danger unless they are putting themselves in danger intentionally, right? Um, so it, it, would, it is our decision that de-escalation looks like offering space. Um, de-escalation looks like listening. Um, de-escalation looks like affirming our participants' humanity um, and allowing them space to make the decision that is safe for them. Um, and we just help facilitate that process. So 
de-escalation means treating people like humans, period. So Santa, let's go to three weeks ago at the Walmart in San Leandro where Steven Taylor was there clearly having a mental health crisis. I'm not saying he's a mental health condition. Um, right. You can come in and out of crisis um, daily. Um, what should have happened as opposed to him being gunned down within 55 seconds of San Leandro PD arriving? Um, I'm gonna try not, to, I'm trying to like center myself and not curse. Um, you can curse us. We don't have no FCC <laughs> when I'm on radio show. Uh, um, logistically speaking, because like there was a police officer who was on scene, I think first they have an array of non lethal weapons that they could have used, and unfortunately, they do not depend on those because they do not view us as human, right. Um, there was asking the young man what he needed, right? There was asking the young man what he wanted. There was asking the young man, what is his goal, right? Because a lot of the times when folks are in crisis, they have a need, but perhaps do not have the language nor capacity to express those needs, right? And then we fail to ask that question, right? Sometimes our system is focused on controlling our behavior and not taking care of the person. So had MH first been on the scene hypothetically, our first question likely would have been, what is it that you need? Mm -hmm. um, and depending on the answer to that question, we would have tried to provide or assist him in meeting that goal, right? Um, because it was a public place, the folks that were um, yelling, screaming in the background, our safety liaison would have been having conversations with those people about how, it, how it's as important for them to remain calm as it is important for him to remain calm, right? Maybe even asking folks to give space and a perimeter so to increase the chances of that young man being safe and of them being safe. Um, had the police shown up, we would have reminded them that they had non-lethal options if they had to engage, right? Um, and hopefully if they had to engage, he wouldn't have been shot. Maybe he would have been tased, which is not favorable, or maybe he just would have had his ankle broken. And I'm just speaking in, in real terms, right? Not like in the utopian, well, what if, and all this, no, like hopefully, maybe he just would have got a broken ankle or maybe he would have got tased, but he would have been alive, you know? Sandra, what do you say to people, particularly law enforcement, right? Because their responses, uh, civilians uh, are not equipped to deal with these kinds of issues. What if somebody has a gun? I don't talk to police. So, um, I, and hy hypothetically, I would probably <laughs> say, fuck you. Um, <laughs> no, really, I'd probably say. I, 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 I did say I, we weren't on my show. So, there you go. <laughs> I, would, I would probably say, fuck you. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. You know what I mean? People, you got a gun. People got guns. There was like fucking people on the Capitol steps with guns. So I don't even understand that rationale, right? Um, just because someone has a gun does not make them immediately unsafe. Again, I would ask, what is it that you need, right? What is, what are you using? What goal is it that you were using that gun to meet? Right? That, that would be my question. Um, and then we all have, anytime I do a training, whether that be the trauma centered first aid training, whether that be first responders training, whether it be for mental health first, I ask anyone to check in with themselves and determine what safety looks like, what their risks are, and how they want to engage for themselves, right? So it's, it's not up to me to answer that question to anyone, um, especially police, I think. I mean, I think it's also important to just highlight here that that's actually not the vast majority of cases that come through. So in the same way, um, you know, when we talk about abolition and ending prisons and people say, well, what about the pedophiles or the rapists or the murderers, whatever? Sure. Are there people that should not be walking among us, you know, without any checks and balances? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. However, that is not the vast majority of people that are languishing mm -hmm. in American concentration camps. Those people are 
you know, <laughs> people with substance abuse issues, mental health issues, mm -hmm. women who utilized, you know, um, force to get out of a violent situation with their mm -hmm. perpetrators. Um, and so again, it's like, let's not go to the, the worst extreme example. Why don't we talk mm -hmm. about the majority of the day-to-day -day calls are. Would you agree with that? Oh yeah, for sure, for yes. sure. Um, and, and most of our calls are really dealing with folks that are overwhelmed and underserved, right? Um, mm -hmm. And that is, and, and that is not the guy with the gun, right? That is mm -hmm. the mom who's working, and the kids won't be quiet, right? Um, and mm -hmm. mom needs to sleep, and now what? It's that person, mm -hmm. you know. So Annie, I just want to make sure you get this comment from Dr. Patricia Nunley at the Western Region. She she is the Western Region Rep for the National Association of Black Psychologists and also the Community Outreach hey. Coordinator for the local chapter in Oakland, California. Hey, they would like sir. to invite us on to our MH first uh, slash APTP to present uh, to them. Annie, you got it? Okay, great. Annie says she's got it. Okay, we've got just about nine minutes left. Want to make some um, headway to some more questions. We've got three in the queue. If you've got a question you've been holding on to, now's the time to put it in the queue. Um, okay, so Tasia, yes, there, there's going to be uh, quarterly online trainings. So I'm going to skip that one. Um, we are going to have more of those on Jitsi. Um, Lindsay Felton is real list. We can sign up to get trained when MH first comes to Oakland. Lindsay, please follow the APTP page um, for that information. And hopefully you're signed up to get our emails. So I'm going to go through that one. Um, Rachel says, I really love this model and appreciate that you have found ways to build this program outside of the mental health system. I am just curious how you feel this has been beneficial and what challenges has it brought? I think the most I don't know if this is gonna sound weird, but I think the greatest work that we've done is allowed people um, the space to reimagine, um, to reimagine what healthcare looks like, to reimagine what mental health care looks like, um, to reimagine what our treatment and safety plans look like and feel like and who's in the center of them. Um, We've had um, the opportunity to see how someone is treated differently when they show up to a hospital um, with an advocate next to them. Um, and I think that as a group, we want to explore like what that looks like, right? Because um, it is currently part of our framework to like walk folks into the emergency room if um if that's what they need right but now i'm wondering what does it look like for us to stay you know what i mean um mm. stay stay as long as we legally can um what does it look like for us to stay um to continue to provide support right to um to someone who is obviously maybe not in our shared reality um but also having to bump up against a healthcare system that is like mad traumatic even when you're not in crisis right um especially if you're a person of color, especially if you're someone who's dif differently able, especially if you're non-binary, trans, queer, right? Um, bumping up, in, up against the healthcare system consistently that doesn't affirm who you are um, by your own definition, right? Um, or even a healthcare system where normalcy is um, dependent on whether or not you're white or male, right? Like being white and male is normal, everything else deviates from that, you know? Um, I hope that answers your question. Uh, Sonia Lewis, what's up, sis? Sonia says, at the end of the day, we all can have mental health breaks and advocate for all people having a safety plan in place. Question, how do we force the healthcare system to honor our needs? Brad, I don't know. That's, I don't know. I think, I actually, I see you, Lisa. I know you're in here. Um, Lisa's an elder. She's she's also for me. She's an elder, like in the healthcare field, right? Um, I don't know, man. It's it's <laughs> it's it, it's a good question. I feel like um, we create the healthcare system creates codependent relationships, right? With our um, with our population, I feel like the best thing we can do is just um, 
is to give folks the information that they need to take care of themselves. Um, and also giving them the kind of education that allows them to interact with our current healthcare system in a way that they're informed, right? Like they know what their rights are. They know like if, if you tell the doctor, I think, you know, I need to be scanned, right? And the doctor's like, nah, you don't need to be scanned. How to tell the doctor what I need you to document in my chart that I requested a CT scan and that you're refusing it, right? Just those little tidbits um, kind of empower folks instead of this relationship between you and your doctor being just do what I say and you'll be fine, right? Because that's not always the case. Um, we've got just about four minutes left. I want to um, thank everybody who tuned in. We At one point, we had 140-something people that were on the mm -hmm. line, which is pretty amazing. For the first of this series, I want to remind people that this is one out of the next six weeks where we're talking about community response to community crisis. Next week, we'll have our folks from Youth Justice Coalition talking about their program, CAT 911. Um, but in the meantime, we've had a couple of questions, Asantua, around making money from this work. So I want to remind folks that what Asantua said is that everybody's volunteer. That does not mean that the work is free. <laughs> there's materials, there's time, there's cell phones, there's RV gas, there's all of these things. So Asantua, if somebody wants to donate to MH First specifically, how do they do that? So um, APTP Sacramento has a Venmo. Um, we also have a cash app and it's all APTP sat. Um, mm, uh, could you find a link to put up Annie? Annie did. Annie put a link in the chat. Okay. Donate cool. the Venmo link to MH first. So y'all can look at the chat. You can copy it, paste it into all of your social media platforms and send some dollars to these folks doing absolutely amazing work um and just again, put was, mh first in the chat in the in the the, the, the text just so we know because we want to make sure if you donate money for mh first that it goes to mh first right so just put that in the in the right. comments asantua any last um comments um we've spent a lot of time attempting to dismantle the systems that don't affirm us and that is valid and necessary work and some of us are going to have to start building the systems that we want to see um with the framework that affirms us with a framework that um centers us so to my folks who are dismantling keep fucking dismantling um to the rest of us let's get creative and that was really why APTP was born, which for folks sure. who don't know, was based off of a comment Asantua made after a protest, um, like one in a series of hundreds of protests, where Asantua said, I feel like we're chasing dead bodies. We're in my kitchen. And it just spurred this conversation of what is it like? We have to react, right? Like we can't not react when the state kills us, but what does it look like to envision something different and build towards that difference? And that is really why APTP was born, how APTP was born. The first thing we built was the first responders and now we've got MH First and we look forward to continuing to working with all of you to figure out how law enforcement is not the answer to every single social ill we have in our society oh, and how we build alternatives to the system that is killing us. Um, I wanna thank you Asantua for taking an hour out of your day and for all of your amazing, amazing work. Y'all, if you feel so inclined, please do donate and join us next Friday at noon. Um, for CAT 911, looking at what Southern California is doing. Y'all stay safe, yes, stay healthy. Can't wait for it. All right, y'all. Peace out. Peace.